Sean, we're hyped. We're starting the show a bit different than normal. We are ready for a legendary take, I think. Or you know, we're looking for players with legendary upside in this NFL draft. And it's Bory. We've Pat Corain on from legendaryupside.com. You'll know him as well from Ship Chasing. We're looking forward to diving into the prospects and get some of his thoughts on them here as we go through today's show. But Pat, excited for this NFL draft? No, I think yeah, it's an exciting NFL draft. It's a it's not a strong running back class. Um, it's a kind of weird wide receiver class in that it, there is a lot of depth, but some of that depth is dependent on the the NFL liking these guys more than the analytical profiles. Um, but then there are some true blue chip wide receiver prospects in this class as well. Uh, there's a blue chip tight end prospect, and it's a I think a very strong quarterback class. So. It's just the the lack of running backs um, really kind of at the top and throughout. Like it's, this running back class doesn't have – like last year I was like, hey, you know, we don't get a Bijan a lot. We should be kind of thankful for that. That makes the running back class as a whole th – that alone makes it kind of good because you just rarely get a Bijan. But that you know, we can't even make that, that argument this year. Well, Pat, it's pretty exciting to have you on the show and – I mean, I said this last year, obviously probably don't need to say it, but with all of the best ball legend, I think that, you know, some people you know, may not realize that you are also, if not the best, you know, one of a handful of the best dynasty analysts. And it was also a lot of fun. You and I had some good luck with our teams together we last did. year. We did. We were able to take down a, a 1250 dynasty. Um, I believe the team that you and me and Eric drafted in your marathon made it fairly deep with the old uh, Jerry Goff, Sam Laporta connection. So, yeah. I mean, this, we made this the seems semis like a... In Best Ball Mania. Yeah. So I'm excited to get your takes on some of these guys. The other thing I wanted to mention as we get into the quarterbacks, you've got a couple quarterback articles out there. One of the things I love about getting legendary upside in my inbox is that a lot of the titles, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of the titles are clicky, like in a good way where I'm like, okay, well, that seems very exciting. And then you back it up in the piece. I started at his man. That's, that's, uh, that's how you trained us. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to get into to all that, including the quarterback that, you know, you mentioned as having massive upside in a minute, but I know that column wants to start you out with a chance to just, you know, go way over the top with the top guy here. Yeah, we have to start out hot. So we have uh, Caleb Williams. Is it wrong to have him as the quarterback one in all of Dynasty? Is that too wow. high? Yeah, I mean, so that's that's bringing up the Mahomes comparison right out of the right out of the gate, which is where people go a lot with Caleb Williams um, because he has some of that similar playmaking magic to Mahomes. My my read on on Caleb Williams in that way is that that's like kind of fair like he has some of that that same magic to his game but i think the thing with williams is that he doesn't avoid mistakes like mahomes mahomes just is the down to down consistency um is just so so strong uh it just ultimately makes him a much better quarterback i think and one who can just get loaded up with attempts because he doesn't make mistakes, right? Like you can, there's a reason why you can pass all the time if you're the chiefs, because <clears throat> Mahomes is going to just take care of the ball and make big plays. Um, and that's kind of the thing I, I'm a little bit worried about with Williams. Um, and I, I think from a fantasy perspective, that could lead to him captaining, not like low volume passing offenses, but not getting to the point where he's just like, you know, getting loaded up with attempts like Joe Burrow or Patrick Mahomes or or Justin Herbert before Greg Roman came along. So that that would be my concern with. That. And is there any chance that he doesn't go as the QB one in the NFL draft? No, I, I mean I think he's locked in. And man, they they've set it up so well for him. You know, they might even be able to like land a Dunze at nine. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be so awesome. That, so there you go. Okay, I mean. Maybe he's not Mahomes, but he's got weapons that Mahomes does not have right now. And DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, uh, it's Cole kind of funny. Legit, it's kind of funny like, the situation, obviously, that they the Bears find themselves in is kind of partly because of the trade with the Panthers. Well, it's completely 
to do with the trade with the Panthers, but they're kind of in the opposite of what the Panthers did last year, where they're trying to set the quarterback up for success rather than <laughs> yeah. just get him out of theater. It's a weird thing to do, but we'll see how it goes. I don't know. I'm skeptical. <laughs> now, Pat, I mean, Caleb Williams is obviously the one, and I do have him ranked extremely, extremely high. And yet, <laughs> Blair and I have the 101 in an RB Triflex League where we tell the listeners this all the time. We have the back draw. You want to win the back draw. I love that part of it. You know, you can't have a team that like scored zero points in one zero games and get the 101. You got to win the back draw. Our team is actually pretty good. And so if we execute on the 101, I mean, I think we've got as good, if not better chance than any other team to win the title this year. So you don't want to blow that. The flip side is that I have a huge problem not trading down or the problem is that I trade down always. And when you're looking at these next couple of guys, <laughs> you have Jaden Daniels, you have Drake may and wildly riskier. But I mean, the fantasy upsides, I think you could argue are even higher if they hit. And so kind of take, us through what we were looking at with these guys we've got a, a slender old qb who has this like really crazy combination of potential passing and rushing upside that I, I mean i'll let you make the case for either this is true or not but maybe that we've almost never seen before but i mean obviously <laughs> there are some of the warts with that versus a younger guy much sturdier you know, this freak of nature, potential passer, also the running element. And I mean, you've got that different production trajectory, although, you know, without as much production, obviously, in the final year. How are you balancing these profiles that both have a ton of upside and have different kinds of risk? Yeah, I mean, Daniels has scared me, honestly, the whole way because he's slender, he takes massive hits. Um, you know, he's kind of like anytime there's a highlight reel of, of you getting hit, that's a that's a red flag. <laughs> and there's legitimate highlight reels. Uh, Danny Kelly, I believe Nate Tice, Nate Tice said he had some Johnny Knoxville to his game. And then Danny Danny Kelly tweeted out a highlight reel uh, that very much showed Johnny Knoxville to, <laughs> to Jaden Daniels game. And then Hayden Winks had one of the best tweets of the offseason <laughs> where it was one of those absolutely brutal hits that he took. And it's the all 22. And there's something that's really great about it with this, you know, total silence. <laughs> there's no no sound at all. And he goes, this is like, this was first in 10 from like the 30 on and in week one. And he just like, he, he drops back and he just runs right up the cut and just gets smoked. <laughs> You're just like, dude, <laughs> there was nothing about the situation where you should have been putting your body in jeopardy. So he's got, I mean, he's definitely going to have to take way better care of himself in the NFL. Um, and, you know, that that definitely makes me nervous. Like he's, um, when, because the path to his fantasy success is him running the ball. So if he now needs to learn to take better care of himself, does he stop running the ball as much? Jaden Daniels was not really all that impressive of a, of a passer until this past season. And then he was really awesome, but he was throwing to Malik Neighbors who looks like an incredible wide receiver prospect and Brian Thomas, who's going to go first round a um, bit more of a boom bust profile, but you know that those are really good. Number one, number two options to throw to. So Daniels definitely worries me. I'm more worried about him from a dynasty perspective, where if you invest in Jaden Daniels, when you had the chance to take like a Malik neighbors or a Brock Bowers, who's an a, a credible tight end prospect or another really good quarterback prospect like Drake may, uh, it, it does strike me as the type of thing you could just be like looking back at that pick for years and going like, God damn. <laughs> but in best ball, I'm like, I'm taking Daniels um, and I'm trying to make sure I'm overweight. Um, and I'm also overweight Drake May. I'm also trying to get Caleb Williams. But, you know, in best ball, we're spreading out our bets a little bit more, a little bit less worried about, you know, the downside. Certainly the long term downside doesn't matter. Um, and so I think Daniels hits the ground running, literally. Um, and so, you know, he should be productive right away. So that's kind of how I'm playing with Daniels with may. Um, I do think there's some long-term risk as well, but I think the perception of may in the fantasy community is off. I don't think people realize 
the archetype that we're getting here. This dude is an aggressive passer. He's got a really good deep ball. He runs a fair amount. He's a good passer to the middle of the field. Uh, I think he'll fit in with like a number of different schemes, and I think he's going to put up fantasy points in a big way. Uh, he has a pretty similar rushing profile overall to Caleb Williams. You know, he he ran for fewer uh, touchdowns, but he ran for more yards per game, and he was a more willing scrambler from a clean pocket, a lot more willing, which I think points to his aggressive mentality. He's gonna. Caleb is aggressive, but he's more like going to run around, run around, run around, throw down field is kind of his move, right? Which isn't really what you want. Which isn't really what we want. Just run, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it can be pretty amazing. But, like, consistently putting in fantasy points, Drake May has a really nice path that he's a big dude who who's willing to run. Um, so I'm really bullish on Drake May from a long-term perspective, from, you know, best ball perspective. I think he's a crazy underpriced invest in best ball. I'm hammering him in best ball. I think the only way that doesn't pay off is if he goes to the giants and they, they like, you know, platoon him with Daniel Jones in the rookie year or something. But if he's assuming he goes top three, he's going to start all the games. Uh, and I think he, I think people are going to be surprised with how productive and fantasy friendly his skill set is. And to me that protects his long-term value. And since I think we're going to get a, per, a, a perception shift on Drake may during his rookie season, that if you decide at that point that maybe his footwork is too spotty or that he's missing too many layup throws or you know you're worried about bench risk in a year or two after that, I think you're getting out at a profit still. So um it started to look like you know if you can like you can get May potentially at like 105 in, in some of these rookie drafts like that is a it's kind of a generational wealth opportunity I think <laughs> like you know it's kind of crazy if he if he's sitting there in a rookie draft. Now you mentioned kind of the the rushing profiles for both guys, and it, it's interesting because the player I think with the more upside you are more concerned about. Right. One of the things that you and I have talked about for a long time with Dynasty is, you know, how to make sure you stay young, but then also understanding that while the rookies have you know, more bust potential than maybe we want to think as you're drafting that you do still in most cases have a chance to get out before you have to pay that penalty. How are you looking at that with these quarterbacks? And obviously you referenced some of the guys who have struggled in talking about in your May article and talking about guys like, you know, a Trey Lance or, you know, obviously Zach Wilson, somebody who has struggled badly from the beginning, but was able to play a lot of games. You have this situation now with Bryce Young, where I actually see a lot of people still paying, you know, pretty decent prices to acquire him, which kind of goes to that point. At the same time, you know, where he's valued in best ball certainly gives us a feel for, you know, what the perception is for this year. And I mean, that perception could be wrong, but based on those prices, I think you should certainly be on the side that's getting out as opposed to getting in right too. now. Yeah, I do too. How, how do you balance that? Because we have seen some of these big guys with Anthony Richardson getting hurt, Trey Lance getting hurt. Uh, the big guys can get hurt too. Obviously, one of the ones that's working really well is that Josh Allen will take hits and has just been a machine. Does the size for May insulate him some or are there other elements there one of the things is that i mean sam howell was a better peak rusher at north carolina than may and then that didn't translate that well into the nfl despite the fact that howell also had a lot better evasion numbers but there's such different physical profiles that i mean there's a lot going on there that's not like you know one thing or the other will necessarily work right yeah i think with so part of it for May, I think his passing profile is, is very, very exciting. Um, and I think potentially more with, more able to be one of these guys who gets loaded up with passing attempts. The The big difference between him and Daniels as a passer is sacks. Um, Daniels takes a ton of sacks. It's a, it's a big problem. He's got a 24% uh, pressure to sack rate which is, it's not like in the Justin Fields zone at 29%, um, but it's it's pretty high. Um, whereas Drake May, 
it's a it's a red flag. He's at nineteen percent, but that's that's fine. That's what Caleb Williams has. That's a little bit below Baker Mayfield, uh, like well below Joe Burrow at twenty two percent. But you know, in Daniels, you have a guy that takes more sacks than than Burrow, and in May, you've got a guy who has a similar sack rate to Justin Herbert, who was at eight eighteen percent. You know, he will take sacks, but it's not like a huge huge issue. And that's one way that you can get to passing volume. Like if you can throw the guy out there and he's not taking negative plays, then I think you're you're more likely to get that volume, which we need. Um, and I just have more confidence in May's deep passing ability as well because he, he showed it over the course of his career rather than just that one season. Uh, he had a big-time deep throw on 5.7% of his career dropbacks. Jaden Daniels was at... 3.3 percent so pretty huge difference there that's not like the end of the world for daniels because he is a true dual threat and we see guys succeeding with those kind of lower deep throw numbers the guys that we tend to see succeed there are actual uh true dual threats so it's not like the end of the world but i think may has a more exciting profile that's similar you know more similar to you know guys like Josh Allen, who was at 5.9%. Andrew Luck, who was at 6%. Like these guys who can actually consistently challenge deep. Um, and then if you're adding that to like a higher volume passing profile, that that's the part of it. I, I guess I see the Daniels path to being like an elite passer as thinner um, because of the sack taking is, is really the main reason there. So then the final kind of big thing that we have to consider with these top three QBs, if we assume that they go one, two, three, is that as you and Colin talked about at the top, it looks like Caleb Williams has set up pretty well. Although I think there are some, you know, arguably some still some stealth issues there. But then we have Washington and we have New England for the two and three. Mm -hmm. We've talked about Bryce Young. I mean, you probably still have to overcome the situation much, much better than he did. And I mean, it was fair to question C.J. Stroud's surroundings, and he has yeah. one of the greatest rookie seasons of all time. But how how concerned should we be for both of these teams, and maybe especially like if May goes to New England? I, you talked about if he falls to the 105, and even at the 105 with some of the other guys in this class, it seems like it's going to be scary if you have to play for this version of the Patriots. No, it's true. And, you know, so in – my article you, you're alluding to, I, I wrote about, you know, the dynasty market and how we do have windows to get out on these guys, even when they are absolute true busts. On ship chasing, Ben Gretsch noted he traded Zach Wilson away for two seconds after his rookie year. Like that's pretty good, <laughs> you know. You can still get. And Bryce Young, I think, is a great example of a guy that probably should be more difficult to move on from than than he is right now. Uh, Trey Lance's price went up after his rookie season. He attempted just 71 passes. <laughs> he got more expensive. That's that's the way these things tend to go. And I think Daniels, you know, will run. I feel very confident that he will run. So if you're if you just want to play it, you know, as the value game there, and you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a kind of free look at this guy and see how good he is, and um, his value will probably be the same or slightly higher as long as he's not an absolute disaster. I, I think that's true. The problem is you're passing on like Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors. I mean, these are elite wide receiver prospects. You're passing on Drake May, who I also think is a, a really exciting quarterback prospect. So, you know, and you can make the same case for May. Like if, if May stinks, you know, and he just looks like a kind of a failed project after year one, you know, or he's kind of like the next Blake Bortles or something. We're like, maybe we get a productive year in here somewhere, but it's, he's not it, you know, that kind of vibe. Then, I mean, yeah, you can get out, but you're not getting to neighbors. You're not getting to Harrison. This is your one chance to get those guys. So I think that's, to me, that's what makes this tricky is you really have to decide if it's worth, you know, that, that swing for the upside at quarterback, because when you hit on a quarterback in Superflex, it's so huge, but there is huge opportunity cost as well this year in a way that's a little atypical, just at, especially at wide receiver. Like we don't get two wide receiver prospects this good very often. 
The next player up, and we're looking at basically the next quarterback in the list, is J.J. McCarthy. He may be the trendiest player in the draft at this moment in time. You know, coming in with athleticism, a winning resume, solid stats on key downs. But we're looking at situations where you mentioned there, like the teams, Chicago setting their quarterback up, but the other teams below that are in pretty difficult situations. Out of those quarterbacks, for him to have success in the NFL, do you think there's going to be a there's obviously going to be this reliance on all players, but for him particularly, is it going to be a huge reliance on coaching and scheme for him to have success? Yeah, yeah. I think McCarthy is very dependent on landing in a good situation, having good weapons, and playing point guard. Like that's kind of what he is. He's mobile, um, but he's not like a dual threat guy. He's gonna he's gonna make some plays with his legs. Um, and you know, I know it's a kind of people see it as a you know a dirty word, but a game manager is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, he's a game manager. But you know, I mean, Brock Purdy's a game manager. And, and then is he? That's what I was going to say. Is he? And the would you put him <laughs> in a Brock Purdy or an Alex Smith? Is that kind of the what we're looking at? Is the upside? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think so. And you know, he's a young guy, three year guy, um, and he's got the tools. He's got a big arm. Uh, you know, he was he was a lot bigger than I was worried he might be. You know, it was like he was listed, I think, at one ninety nine or something uh, at Michigan. So you're like, oh god, you know, is this? Why aren't people talking about this? Is he just another kind of Bryce Young? Is, is he tall Bryce Young? You know, he's he's gonna weigh in at two hundred one at the combine. And we all know he's been just, just eating nonstop to get there. But then he showed up. I think he was two nineteen or something. He was much bigger than uh, than we had anticipated. So, uh, and then he ran a good three cone. So he you know uh, he can play in the in the two teens. I forget exactly what he weighed in at, but um, the size isn't really a concern and there's upside of him continuing to develop as a passer, which then would lead to more volume, I think. Because the big the big red flag is that he wasn't really allowed to pass in college, which which seems bad. <laughs> you know, if you're a quarter you're then remember you're this guy's a, a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy is like, you know, that's his general, his primary responsibility. He was I, I put a little chart together um looking at 25 plus dropbacks, 35 plus dropbacks, and 45 plus dropbacks in your games. Okay. So, like, for example, Drake May hit 25 plus dropbacks in every single game uh, last season. Uh, Caleb Williams was at 92%. Jaden Daniels was at 92%. Bo Nix, Michael Penix, Spencer Rattler, all at 100%. JJ McCarthy was at 53%. This dude was not passing the ball. If you look at 35 plus, May was at 83%, Williams at 67%, Michael Penix at 73%, uh, even Jaden Daniels at 42%. JJ McCarthy was at 7%, and he never hit 45 plus dropbacks in a single game, uh, where May hit that like in 42% of his games. So this guy's like very much a protected, you know, kind of blank slate kind of prospect in that. Um, and Ted Wynn on, um, Davis May or Davis Maddox podcast compared him to Trey Lance in that way, where you can kind of like put your hopes and dreams on him in a way and have them crushed and have them and probably have them <laughs> crushed. But that's, I think some of the appeal here is that we don't know with JJ McCarthy, but he's toolsy and he's a good thrower to the middle of the field. He, he profiles pretty well as that kind of point guard guy. And then you, you kind of talk yourself into him growing and developing over time and becoming one of these elite pocket passers it's possible, but yeah, I mean, he's definitely where I start to get nervous about like, like who even is this guy? Like is, you know, I said this on ship chasing. It got people a little bit, uh, a little bit irritated. I think if you're a JJ McCarthy fan, but I was like, who's a better passer today, JJ McCarthy or Bo Nix? You know, it's, it's not like a slam dunk that, that McCarthy's like you're betting, you're betting on upside with McCarthy, but it's a weird bet because he's a kind of a low, upside archetype of guy um and i get i get why the nfl finds that appealing because they're like this guy can kind of develop into an elite pocket passer and if you're kevin but even if it feels safe taking him in the like top 10 or 15 picks is not a safe way to play it on somebody who has so much you have to project so much but then you also when you look at college it's a situation where like did they just not want them at all to pass 
like you know you're looking then to go into the nfl and if you're in a situation where all of a sudden you know you're four touchdowns down going into the fourth quarter and he has to start you know throwing it 47 times what what's going to happen in that situation as a rookie yeah well I, li- listen if 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 mccarthy's really good then we we cannot be drafting justin herbert because if, if this guy's a star then then they just you know jim harbaugh just does not want to pass the ball so that's that's i think you know we've got to figure out uh we've got to figure that out how good is jj mccarthy or is it is it really just harbaugh limiting the passing attempts because I, I think some of it, it is, is philosophical yeah so we'll see who knows maybe he'll add some competition to the quarterback room there and la and and get mccarthy in there as well if he <laughs> if he lands where people are maybe a string <laughs> we're, 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 we're talking about that. harbaugh here are you like uh you know our whole conversation with travis last week was kind of around how how weird he can be so yeah uh, <laughs> you know things could happen but in terms of like landing spots people are kind of talking themselves into minnesota and obviously that would get him kind of the coaching scheme the weapons it would be outside of chicago if you're looking at some of these top quarterback landing spots the ideal place for a rookie to go in if he goes if he's drafted there and where we're looking at daniels and may going does that potentially have him close the gap on those guys in dynasty or potentially even leap them and i know it's a very specific scenario because he has to land in that perfect spot in minnesota to me, no. I mean, to me, he's not in the tier with those guys. Um, to, I mean, and I want to take Odunze over him, you know, right now. That's where the, to me, that would be the the conversation is at this point, are we feeling confident enough that he's going to be, you know, a, a pretty productive quarterback in it, in an offense that is always pass first, you know, they, I think O'Connell's pretty committed to the pass. And I think McCarthy is a good thrower to the middle of the field. Uh, he has, he has some interesting kind of game manager, you know, point guard type of, of traits that I think will translate well uh, to that system. And it's a good system with great weapons. So um, I still think you're taking the high upside fantasy archetypes over. Like we're not trying to be GMs, right? We're, if McCarthy gets like a second contract, he doesn't get like a, a, a points multiplier added to, you know, his score. Like he's, <laughs> he's, I'm sure you know, there's some dynasty leagues out there that have uh, added in that little, <laughs> little wrinkle. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. Take the guy who's much. We're trying to scout. What can we do on top of what the NFL's doing? I think the most effective way is we can scout the traits that score fantasy points. And McCarthy doesn't really have those in the same way as a Jaden Daniels. I mean, he just doesn't. You know. And I think Drake May as well is is underrated in those traits. You know. Maybe he misses more throws than scouts like or whatever, but he's going to hit some really fun throws too. Uh, that's not really J.J. McCarthy so much. So um, I'm going to have trouble, even if he goes to the Vikings, I think I'm going to have trouble taking him much higher than than the 108, uh, you know, assuming Adunze doesn't. Like if Adunze goes to the Bears and McCarthy goes to the Vikings, then okay, maybe I'll take McCarthy. <laughs> I... I... I'm really tempted to to ask you to just come out and say that JJ McCarthy is going to be a bust because it feels like we're going. <laughs> I, I was going to ask if he doesn't go to like the Vikings or somewhere like that. Like, why would we want him? Like, yeah, he I mean, to somewhere where it isn't ideal. Like, but I th- I think what he has going for him right is that the next most likely scenario is the Broncos, which is pretty good, you know. I mean, I guess if you were to go to the Giants, that would be concerning because I don't know if they get through this season alive. Like they're, you know, we could be looking at a new coach entire staff. team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not predicting. <laughs> I'm not predicting that. But I'm predicting. You got like relegation or asteroid strike. In the- <laughs> asteroid <laughs> strike. <laughs> yeah, it's a real heat check moment for me. I'm starting to predict asteroid strikes. Um, <laughs> The, the I think those guys are kind of sneaky on the hot seat um, in New York. So if if JJ McCarthy doesn't look that great, I, and I I don't think he goes there either. So, but yeah, I mean that's the, probably one of the things that McCarthy has going for him is that he if he goes to the Broncos, I think we're pretty excited too with Sean Payton. I mean he he fits that kind of you know he's pa- pass short a lot. That seems mm. a thing he could do. So um, yeah. I, Certainly, I guess. I guess if you went to the Raiders, that would be 
you know, Luke Getze has not impressed me. So that would definitely be worrying. But that seems the least likely of those three teams. So, Pat, one of the things that you have kind of discussed here is that there are you know, multiple other teams looking for, you know, potential starters, not just guys to compete, but potential starters beyond those first four. And we've got a couple other interesting guys. I wanted to ask you about Michael Penance because, I mean, he recently had a pro day where he looked athletic and <laughs> you're kind of like, well, I mean, there are some games where, yeah, I mean, your team has got to make the national championship, but maybe using that athleticism would have helped as opposed <laughs> to, you know, dumping the ball off and taking hits, what have you. But so he puts on a show. This goes with prolific production down the stretch at Washington, obviously with a great coach, a great offense. He's got um, Odunze, but also maybe two other guys who are better than people realize, or maybe they realize, but just three good guys. You talked about the fantasy traits, how much we don't know. I mean, the problem for Penix, is it that the fantasy traits really aren't there? Is it that, you know, he's... <laughs> performing at this level against much younger and, and less experienced players is it the system or i mean should we actually be buying if you have a chance to get a guy who's going to be a starting quarterback in superflex formats yeah i mean i i've been it's been tough for me to gauge like where the nfl is at on on penix because it seemed like he was the least likely of the top five guys to go in the first round but certainly you know the athleticism should help um what are your thoughts on him? Like his journey, right? Because he had uh, some a, a serious injury, right? Or kind of early on, and then he's come back from that. But then to show the athleticism, if nothing else, would help clear up those injury red flags. I would assume. Yeah. So I mean, I think with Penix, but also with Daniels, that when you dig into it a little bit more, it doesn't erase the fact that they needed massive seasons when they were, you know, more experienced to mm -hmm. kind of generate the enthusiasm that they currently do and yet i think there are reasons to be less worried about it or at least understand how they got there than there are maybe for some similar you know past quarterback prospects who just weren't good and then at the very end they have a big season they get overdrafted they bust what have you yeah the thing with panic so panics had a kept clean scramble rate of 1.3 percent which is like bananas low um, Jaden Daniels was at 9.4%, which is crazy, crazy high. So the, those kind of, those guys sort of represent the, like each end of the spectrum where, and again, the idea there is we want guy Kevin Cole's done some good research showing that scramble rate, um, is, is fairly sticky coming from college to the pros. And then if you're looking at the, the guys who are, uh, scrambling from a clean pocket, right, that's a decision, you know, that's them showing you kind of what they're about a little bit. And Penix is not trying to run. I feel pretty confident about that. So the athleticism, I think, is good. Um, recover from recovering from the injuries and everything. You know, assuming there's no real medical red flags there. But from what I gather, it seems like things have been positive from you know the uh, the combine and, and that type of stuff. But you know, is it going to add a ton to his like fantasy profile? I don't think so. Because I don't think teams are going to use him as like a design runner, and his mindset seems to be about passing downfield, which can be cool. I mean, he does pass downfield pretty well. He's got a big arm. Um, he, you know, he was hitting deep throws at a, at a pretty high rate. So I, I think for me with Penix, I'm not like that sold on him as a prospect. But is he going to get drafted in the first round and get penciled in as a starter? Then, like, yeah, I think I'm pretty in as what probably like a late first round, early second round type of rookie pick. I mean, he could he could go in the first round and still be well outside the you know he could be like the 111 as a first round pick. That seems pretty pretty amazing. Um, so that's but I think. With him, I'm kind of more waiting to see the draft capital. Same with Bo Nix. Like Bo Nix, I could see being, you know, a total backup. I could also see him going in the first round and getting penciled into a starting job. I could see both these guys going in the early second, you know, potentially like to Denver and and being in line to start there. Um, so it's more 
I think they're the type of prospect that it's more about uh, draft capital and situation kind of filling in some of the gaps in the in the profile. Neither has like a stellar profile on paper and neither has a particularly amazing set of like fantasy friendly uh, traits to where I would still be like betting on them through an unclear path to, to starting. 